tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about malicious markers and dangerous dwellings. Also, I'm excited to say that both of tonight's tales are once again Chilling Tales exclusives, debuting with us here tonight, meaning you won't have heard them anywhere else. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and oh, it is good to be back. Tonight I resume my role as your personal guide to the paranormal. Join me, won't you, as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Accompanying us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Jason Calzadilla and Dawn Shea, our voice talents Eric Peabody, Justine Anastasia, and Jason Hill. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Jason Calzadilla and is performed by Eric Peabody. In it, we'll be introduced to a young man plagued by an unnatural road sign outside of his apartment, always showing up in different places. Things escalate when the man finds the sign embedded someplace rather close to home. He's got a feeling the sign has less than good intentions. But is it all in his head? Without further ado, I present to you the stop sign. It was a late July night, and I once again found myself basking in the glow of my TV screen, a controller in one hand and a beer in the other. Empty pizza boxes, chip bags, and various other discarded remnants surrounded me as I fought battle after battle in the latest RPG I had picked up a few days prior. As a depressed loner with no friends, most of my nights were spent this way. To be blunt, I hated myself. I hated my shitty convenience store cashier job, and I hated my sad excuse for a life. My whole existence revolved around working at a job I despised and coming home to vigorously escape my reality. It was a tragic routine, but one that allowed me the luxury of not having to face the realization that my life was going nowhere. After a few hours had passed and I was good and intoxicated, I headed outside to the landing to smoke a cigarette. It was a bad habit, I know. But when you don't have much to live for, the dangers of cigarettes seem frivolous and unimportant. I had just finished lighting up when I instantly noticed something strange. The stop sign usually posted at the intersection next to my apartment building had moved. I've lived in this apartment complex for over five years, and I tell you, the same red, octagonal stop sign that had always been next to the intersection now sat on the sidewalk adjacent to the building. A laugh escaped from my mouth as I realized it must have been some kind of prank. 
I didn't know much about the law, but I knew enough to know that moving a stop sign was illegal and whoever had moved it was going to get their ass thrown in jail if they were caught. But whatever, it wasn't my problem. Someone would move it back eventually, I thought as I took a drag from my cigarette. After gaming for another hour, I decided to call it a night and get to bed. I had to be up early for work the next day, and although I was dreading it, I hated feeling tired on the job. I awoke in the morning feeling strangely nervous, like a wave of anxiety had suddenly washed over me. I laid on my air mattress, staring up at the water stains on the ceiling as I thought about how my life wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. I remembered how I used to have goals and ambition. At one time in my life, I wanted to be a veterinarian because of my love for animals. I even went to college for it. But a few missed classes here and a few bad grades there and all of a sudden, I found myself dropping out. Now I'm a single, 39-year-old college dropout who spends his free time trying to escape reality through video games and alcohol. Was I ever going to get my shit together and pursue something meaningful in my life? Or was I doomed to slowly wither into oblivion, having never come close to my true potential as a human being? I could feel my air mattress deflate a bit as I laid there, deciding if I should even bother going into work. I thought about just getting into my car and driving somewhere far away. Somewhere where I could start over and reignite the passion I once felt for life. With a defeated sigh, I got up to get ready for work. I was on the patio having a smoke before heading off when I noticed that the stop sign I had seen on the sidewalk the night before was gone. Figuring someone had moved it back to its rightful place, I put out my cigarette and began descending the stairs to my car. I was just about at the bottom of the stairs when I looked up and was suddenly taken aback. The stop sign was now posted at the bottom of the stairs. Slowly walking over to it, I saw that it stood firmly in the concrete. The signpost didn't even budge when I shook it, as if whoever put it there had used some impressively fast-drying cement. If this was a prank, then someone had gone to great lengths to pull it off. A smile formed on my face as I contemplated the absolute absurdity of it. Whoever was going to have to chisel this out of the concrete was probably going to be super pissed, but, again, it wasn't my problem. I walked to my car, smiling and shaking my head. Maybe whoever did it was caught on camera, or maybe not. At any rate, I was sure it would be in a different spot by the time I got back. Work was incredibly shitty that day. There seemed to be an unusually high amount of irate customers that would yell at me for stupid reasons like how we didn't carry a specific brand of potato chips or how we were out of their favorite scratcher. The day dragged on painfully. By the end of my shift, I was so ready to get back to my apartment to roam through the hills and forests of my game while drinking myself into a coma. The dim light in the sky was quickly fading to night as I pulled up to my apartment building. I sat for a few minutes, finishing a cigarette, before exiting my car and making my way over to the stairs leading up to my apartment. Immediately, I noticed that the stop sign that had been there earlier was gone. I looked to see if it had left a hole in the concrete in the spot where it last stood, but to my surprise, it hadn't. The concrete was completely smooth, leaving no trace that the stop sign had ever been there. I looked over to see if it was back in its rightful place next to the intersection, but it wasn't. Something about this situation was beginning to make me feel uneasy. That feeling intensified a hundredfold when I made my way to the top of the stairs to see the stop sign posted directly in front of my unit's door. Why the fuck was it there? I thought as I walked slowly over to it. As before, 
I tried to pick it up and once again I couldn't. It was stuck firmly into the concrete as if it had been there since the building's construction. I stood staring at the stop sign as questions began flooding my mind. Why did someone put it in front of my door? Was it put there at random or was someone deliberately targeting me? If so, why? I didn't know enough people to have enemies. Did I inadvertently anger one of my neighbors? Why would someone do something this petty as revenge? The more I thought about it, the more the whole situation started to piss me off. After a bad day at work, I didn't want to deal with this shit. Nevertheless, whoever put it there had made it my problem, and now it was my responsibility to do something about it. Determined not to let it ruin my night, I decided to tell the apartment manager about it in the morning before work. I spent the rest of the night getting drunk on cheap beer and giving my thumbs an intensive workout. All the while, I couldn't stop thinking about the stop sign. I kept catching myself glancing at the door as if I could sense the stop sign taunting me on the other side of it. I'd bet whoever had put it there was having a good time at my expense. There was probably more than one of them, maybe even a whole group of them, mocking me and talking about what a fucking loser I was. I could imagine their sinister grins as they laughed at how I was so lowly and pathetic that they could do something so ridiculous as put a stop sign in front of my door, and there was nothing I could do about it. Oh, how they must have been delighting in my helplessness, I thought as I gritted my teeth. These thoughts festered in my brain, fueled by an ever-increasing flow of alcohol. Eventually, my inebriation reached an intensity so great that the thoughts began to boil over until they spilled into action. Before I knew it, I'd reached into my closet to retrieve the baseball bat I kept for protection and marched with purpose towards the door. I stopped and took a long swig of beer before reaching for the door handle, ready to smash the stop sign and anybody that got in my way into a pulp. I would show them that they couldn't mess with me so quickly, and that I was willing to do something about it. With my bat raised high into the air, I flung the door open, ready to strike, when my heart suddenly plummeted into my stomach. The stop sign was gone. I spent the next few hours gaming until my eyes glazed over and drinking until the events of the day became a hazy, muddled blur in my mind. I didn't want to think about anything more that night. Not about the stop sign, not about anything. I would surely pay for it the next day at work when I had to nurse a hangover the size of an elephant, but I didn't care. I just wanted to forget all about the night's events. At some point, I must have found my way onto my air mattress and passed out, because the next thing I remember was waking up, screaming in agony. I looked in horror to see something metal jutting out from my lower abdomen. The holy pattern on the long metal beam looked familiar, and before my eyes gazed upwards to confirm what it was, I already knew. It was the stop sign. Its post had impaled my body completely through, like a shish kebab. I tried desperately to pull it out, but I couldn't move it. It had gone straight through my now deflated mattress and was stuck firmly into the floor. Blood poured from the wound, and I knew that if I didn't get help quickly, I would bleed to death. Luckily, my phone was within arm's reach, so I grabbed it and frantically dialed 911. The last thing I remember before blacking out was the sound of the operator as I quickly rattled off my address. I awoke in a hospital bed with a doctor standing at my side. After asking me a few routine questions, he told me how lucky I was to have survived. He then went on to explain how I got there. An ambulance and police arrived at my apartment within minutes after my call. 
The police had to bust down my door when I didn't respond to their knocks. They found me in a pool of blood, passed out and barely alive. He said I was lucky because whatever caused my wound had missed all of my vital organs, and if I had waited even a minute longer to call for help, I would have died. The doctor then asked me if I knew what had caused my injury, but when I asked if anyone had seen the stop sign, he looked at me confused. He assured me that nothing of that nature was found at the scene. I knew he wouldn't believe me if I told him what I had experienced, so I told him that I must have fallen onto something but didn't remember what it was. It's been two days since I was released from the hospital after being there for almost a week. I didn't want to come back to my apartment, but I don't have any family or friends to stay with, so I didn't know where else to go. The whole ordeal has left me terrified, and I haven't slept since I got back. I lost my job for no call, no show, but I don't really care. I'll worry about getting another one later. For now, I need to focus on trying to figure out why that stop sign attacked me. Did a demon possess it? Was it a glitch in the Matrix? Was it some warning from the universe? Fueled by coffee and nicotine, I've been searching the internet non-stop for any hint of explanation. I won't give up until I find a way to stop it. I don't have a choice. Nobody would believe me if I told them. They would think I was crazy. Whether I like it or not, I'm entirely on my own with this, and I need to figure something out fast. Because a few minutes ago, I looked out my window and saw a stop sign in a place where a stop sign shouldn't be. I fear that it is after me again, and next time, it might not miss a vital organ. What's my happiest memory with dear old dad? Oh, where to start? There are so many. Um, playing catch in the park, for one. A little cliche, but that one is popular for a reason. Um, my first fishing trip to the lake, ice cream sundays after soccer practice, getting dropped off at school. Well, that last one was mostly because it meant I didn't have to listen to Rush Limbaugh anymore that morning, so well, that was a big one. But I guess my most cherished memory of my dad was uh, when he taught me how to shave. An important early step in every boy's life in learning how to be a man. But... The only advice he provided me on the subject was how to shave my face. And as most of you boys out there know, the face is the easy part. Now for any of you ladies listening out there, I'll have you know that when a man comes of age, he's gifted with two beards. And I'm not talking about the one between your ears. But yeah, in retrospect, I can kind of see why the old man might have found giving me tips on not nicking my nuts might have been a little bit awkward. Though, not as awkward as you might think, as my family lived in the woods and we all had a fairly Scandinavian attitude towards clothing. I'm just saying it would have saved me a few pints of blood and one or two trips to the ED. Ugh. Well, that is a war that most men learn to fight on their own, unfortunately. Either way, you gotta let the gonads breathe. And if you deforest that sinful grove once, you'll be doing it for the rest of your life. And, in case you weren't reminded on a weekly basis, that commitment to mowing mischief's meadow is not for the faint of heart. A real man knows the value of good grooming, and thank the gods that Manscaped is there to lend a hand when nobody else would. Which was probably for the best, actually. Regardless, Manscaped's got the tools for your jewels. Family jewels, that is. Now, close your eyes, if you will, 
Imagine shaving with a sleek, well-designed and optimized trimmer that makes shaving time your favorite time in the bathroom. And that's a tall statement. Am I right, boys? Let's talk details, though. The current jewel in the crown of sack-shearing technology comes from Manscaped's fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0 featuring a cutting-edge ceramic blade that reduces grooming accidents and even allows you to customize your trim through additional guard lengths with sizes 1 to 4. Did I mention wireless charging? It makes a great gift. Did you hear that, girls? Maybe Valentine's Day will come early for that special guy in your life. In many ways, Manscaped is the greatest gift of all. The gift that keeps on giving. But that doesn't get you off the hook, guys. A lot of times your balls just won't wait for Valentine's Day or your birthday or Christmas or what have you. But the good news is you get 20% off and free shipping with the code CHILLING at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. That's manscaped, M-A-N-S-C-A-P-E-D.com and use that code CHILLING. Unlock your confidence, and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Your nads will be eternally grateful. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed The Stop Sign, as written by Jason Calzadilla and voiced by Eric Peabody. If you enjoyed Mr. Peabody's performance, you can hear more of him on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, where he came in second place in 2019's Evil Idol voice acting competition. So, be sure to check out all of his contest performances from that year, as well as his other appearances. You'll also find more of his audio production, music composition, and voiceover work on his website, vikingguitar.com. If you check him out on YouTube, be sure to give him a thumbs up and leave a kind word whenever possible, and tell him you heard about him here on this program. It would mean a lot to us. To find more of award-winning author Jason Calzadilla, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Calzadilla, spelled C-A-L-Z-A-D-I-L-L-A, -L -L and you'll be redirected to his author profile on creepypastastories.com, where you'll find a way to connect with him, as well as a selection of his stories free to read. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by Don Shea and performed by Justine Anastasia and featuring special guest Jason Hill host of the Horror Hill podcast. In it, we'll be introduced to a woman struggling to balance a fledgling career with a new living situation, but issues arise in her apartment that are less than favorable, and the tenants that cohabitate the building turn out to be even worse. They say that home is where the heart is, but we just might be about to find out how false that sentiment can be. Without further ado, I present to you, Body Alterations. Karen woke in a sweat, the peripheral of her dream slowly dissipating. Again that smell. She took a long, deep breath and groggily massaged her nose, though it did not help. It never did. In fact, the nauseous stench of putrid flesh seemed to linger for hours after the dream had ended, almost as if the scent escaped the confines of her nightmare and hauntingly resided in her nostrils. She knew it was all in her head, but she couldn't seem to shake the feeling of the dreamscape. She could still remember the man was there, face shaded by the bill of his cap. He was looming over her, forcing her to choke down rotten meat mixed with hard bits, like pebbles. She gagged, thinking about it. She could never see his face, and she wondered what horrors lurked under the bill of that hat. He never spoke, only grunted. She looked around the room and saw that it was still dark out. 
No use trying to go back to sleep, she thought. You might as well get on with the day. Shower. She needed to start with a shower. Maybe it would help get the smell out of her nose. She strode to the bathroom and, once there, stared into the mirror. There was a smear of blood on her face. She wondered how it got there. She checked her reflection for any wounds. Finding none, she checked her pillow. All was fine in the bedroom, not so much as a sheet out of place. She started to undress without giving it another thought when she heard it. The clanking sound of old pipes and a drill. The guy downstairs... He's such a weirdo, she thought to herself. She had only heard of him through her landlady, Miss Wyndham. Accordingly, she had the main floor. Lucy lived upstairs in the loft. And David? Daniel? His name eluded her, had the basement. It had worked out pretty well so far. Mostly everyone kept to themselves. Especially that guy. He rarely left the house that she knew of. Miss Wyndham had mentioned he was in some security business that allowed him to work from home. She still thought that was odd. How did he get food, she wondered. She had never seen him go to the grocery store. He was generally quiet except for the occasional construction noise, and every so often, a weird smell. She put it off to old plumbing in the house. Turning on the shower, she didn't have time to worry about the basement dude. She had so much stuff to do today, she was anxious about getting it all accomplished. She focused on the warm shower, letting the anxiety melt away. After dressing, she grabbed her purse and keys and headed out the door to the street. Just as she started down the stairs, the basement door slammed shut. Seeing no one while continuing to her car, she looked around, threw her purse in the back, and slid behind the steering wheel. She was off. The first stop was to the florist to go over orders. You could not have a big southern party without an abundance of flowers. They couldn't be just any flowers either. They had to be perfect. They had to be the most eloquent assortment for the grandest family in Georgia, the McMahons. Her anxiety returned at the thought. It was the first big event she had acquired since venturing out on her own three months ago. The party had to be impeccable, down to the very last detail. Her career may very well be riding on this one event. If she nailed it, she would be swamped with Georgia's most affluent and lavish clients. She was so lost in her fantasy she almost missed the turn for the florist. With quick footwork, she made a left-hand turn barely in time. As the car lurched sideways, she heard a thud from her trunk. Must have left something in there for my pickups yesterday, she thought. No big deal. She would check it when she got back to her shop. She pulled into a parking spot right in front of the florist and jumped out, anxious to start picking out the most stunning bouquets money could buy. It was the longest and most tedious day Karen could remember when she finally made her way back home. She had been so busy she had no chance to eat, and every part of her body ached. She had every intention of taking a long, hot bath, followed by the warmth of her favorite flannel pajamas. Supper would be popping a lean cuisine in the microwave and getting her nightly glass of Pinot Noir, then falling onto the couch to watch the Love Boat reruns. She was such a sucker for classic TV shows. As she parked the vehicle, she once again heard something slide. As she went to grab her purse, she remembered she had never checked the trunk to see what she had left in there. She bit her lip, hoping it was nothing perishable. She clicked the button on her key fob and saw the trunk pop up in the rear view. Starting around the car, she looked inside and noticed a small metal box lying flat. She picked it up curiously. Was it a part of the car? It hadn't seemed to affect the performance of the car. Scanning the interior trunk space, there was no obvious place for it. She tossed it back in the trunk, telling herself she would have her dad look at it when he came to visit in a few weeks. She shut the trunk, locked the doors with a click of the button, and headed towards the house's steps. She noticed movement out of the corner of her eye from the basement window. Someone had been looking through. Maybe the weirdo was watching for her. (laughs) Karen, get it together. He's probably busy playing Dungeons and Dragons or something, she grimaced. She ran up the stairs and into the house without another thought to laze the rest of the evening away. A few days later, her party planning was done. Two days away from the big event, Karen was sitting on her couch making her list and checking it twice. 
She wanted to ensure that she had it all together and everything was ready to go. She smiled to herself as she read, realizing she had done it. She had planned the perfect party. Just as she was about to close her notebook, she heard a whoosh from the kitchen that sounded like a fully open fire hydrant, followed by a stream of water rushing from her kitchen into the living room. Shit, she thought, jumping up and starting for the kitchen. Water was pouring from the cabinet beneath the sink. She opened it up and was immediately drenched in spray and water. She remembered the water valve was in the basement. Oh, great, she thought, as she stood and looked around. She'd have to get the basement boy to turn the water off. Then she would have to call the super, Harold, to see if he would come to fix the pipe. What a mess to clean up. She walked to the door at the top of the basement stairs and stared at it. She felt queasy. She was not looking forward to this interaction, but it had to be done. She hesitated and then knocked, softly at first, then harder. She heard scuffling behind the door and she waited. After a brief moment, just as her hand was poised to knock again, she heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. She held her breath as she waited for him to open the door. A bolt lock clicked, and the door swung open to reveal a man about 5'9", mid to late thirties with close-cropped black hair and a round belly, which she presumed was from beer and lack of activity. He wore a hunter green robe, hanging open to reveal a somewhat stained white tee underneath. He had on a pair of jeans and flip-flops. She laughed to herself as she gazed at his ensemble. Oh, hi, I'm Karen, you're... He cut her off. I know who you are. She gazed at him momentarily as they had never met in person and wondered how he knew for certain who she was. She smiled politely and attempted to look down the stairs behind him, but it was so dark she couldn't see anything. Okay, well, I had a pipe burst in my apartment and I was wondering if you could turn the water off for me until I can have the super come fix it. He did not directly look her in the face, more towards the left, and he didn't raise his eyes to look at her. Want me to come take a look? I'm pretty handy with fixing stuff. She looked like someone had slapped her across the face. (laughs) No, that's fine. If it's no trouble, could you just turn the water off? Suit yourself. He spun and shut the door. As the door swung shut in her face, she got a faint whiff of a vaguely familiar smell. Just as the foggy memory was coming to her, streaming water swamped her bare feet. She shook her head and whispered, thanks for nothing, creep, and headed back to her kitchen for the mop bucket. Several hours and many beers later, the super had fixed the pipe. She had cleaned the mess and was back in the water business. She had just sat down to go over delivery schedules of equipment for the next day when she heard a knock at the door. She rolled her eyes, grunted, and thought, who the fuck is it now? Better be a Girl Scout with a wagon full of cookies or they can take a fucking hack. She opened the door to reveal Miss Wyndham, her landlady. She looked as refined and impressive as ever in her horned rim glasses, gray hair pulled back into a sleek bun, and her signature brocade jacket with white slacks. She looked Karen up and down, as she often did, and gave her a fake smile. Karen, oh my goodness, are you all right? Harold called me and said he had to come and fix a pipe in your apartment. What happened? She asked, slightly flustered as she was examining her hardwood floors. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Something happened with one of the pipes under the sink. Harold fixed it right up and everything is working as it should. He said no permanent damage. I caught it right when it started. Karen motioned towards the kitchen in the offending sink. Good, good, glad to hear that. I heard you met Douglas as well. Karen stared at her quizzically. Miss Wyndham clicked her tongue and said, The young man that lives in the basement. Recognition struck like a lightning bolt, and Karen switched her weight from one foot to the other. Yes, I did meet him. I had to go and have him turn the water off until Harold could get here, Karen admitted. Dear Douglas would have been glad to help you. He's quite the Bob Vila if you should ever need anything else. He's lived here for a long time. And he's helped with many projects over the years. Job performance superb, said Miss Wyndham, hands clasped to her chest. 
Thanks, I'll keep that in mind, Karen smiled. Okay, sweetie, well, I have to run. I've got an appointment at the hair salon. This rat's nest won't fix itself, you know. She blew Karen a kiss, and in a whirlwind, she was gone. Moments later, thoughts of Lucy crossed Karen's mind. Where was she? She hadn't seen her in three weeks, maybe more. She had been super busy planning the party, and Lucy worked killer hours at the bar, but they always ran into each other at least a couple of times a week, either coming or going. She scratched her head and tried to remember the last time she saw her for sure. Given up, she decided to go up to Lucy's apartment just to check on her. Maybe she was sick, or God forbid, back with that bass player that gave her a black eye as a parting gift when he ran off with some skeezy groupie. She bounded up the stairs, taking them two at a time. She knocked on her door, but heard nothing. She knocked again, and then a third time. Must be at the bar, she thought to herself. Searching her jeans, she found a business card to a favorite Chinese restaurant and scribbled on it quickly. Loose checking on you. Hit me up. I need a plus one for an event. Dying for you to see. Hot K. Sliding it under the door, she descended the stairs with a glance back over her shoulder as a nagging feeling bloomed in the pit of her stomach. Karen went to bed that night, exhausted from the day's events, but excited. As she slept, she dreamed of the man in the hat, the rancid meat, vomiting, crying, begging him to let her go, the scrape of the rusty chains that held her. She had to wake up. She had to get out of this nightmare. She woke with a start and looked around and found herself just where she was when sleep had taken her. She wanted to cry, wanted to scream. The dreams were seriously affecting her sleep and focus. What was causing these atrocious nightmares? Was she stressed? When this event is over, I will go to the doctor and see about getting some sleeping pills. She was sore like she had been in a fight, but she knew it was from lack of sleep. The smell in her nose and the taste in her mouth was making her want to vomit. She made her way to the bathroom, but retched before she made it through the door. As the contents of her stomach emptied onto the floor, the noxious smell of decomposing flesh was stronger than ever. When she was finally finished dry heaving, she stood and felt every bit of energy drained from her body. Fallen to her knees, she wondered if she could even make it back to the bed. She attempted to get to her feet, but made little progress. She collapsed back to the floor and tried to crawl. She felt dizzy and disoriented. She was about six feet from the bed when everything went black. Head pounding, she woke sitting on a cold cement floor. Her arms were chained to a large drain pipe running from the floor to the ceiling. She looked around and saw no one. Where was she? How did she get here? It was cold, and there was that smell. It was intense and so familiar. She recognized it as the smell from her dreams, that disgusting, fated odor. She felt her body reacting to the smell as her stomach started to roll, but there was nothing left to discard. She could hear music coming from nearby. What was that? She knew that song. It was Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes. She groaned and looked around the room again. It was bare, except for a metal table in the middle of the room and a drain directly under. She could see another room behind the table with a light on, but there was nothing else visible beyond the doorway. Her head was foggy and her eyes were blurry. She attempted to pull on the chains. They did not budge. She yanked again, harder. Nothing. She didn't know what to do or how she was going to get out of here. She frantically looked around for any kind of object that might aid in her escape. Seeing nothing, she collapsed back against the wall. She was just about to let the exhaustion take her once more when she heard a sound. She looked to her right. Where from out of the blackness, she saw the figure of a man coming towards her. Her breath caught in her throat. As he neared the light, the fading shadows bred familiarity. It was the man from her dreams. His hat was in place, and he was looking towards the floor. A strangled scream began to rise from her throat, and as it did, the man raised his head to meet her eyes. A new recognition dawned. She screamed as loud as she ever had. It was the basement creep. What in the fuck was he doing here? He smiled sideways. So, 
We meet again, my sweet Karen. She narrowed her eyes at him. Where am I? What am I doing here? He looked surprised. My sweet darling, don't you know your own love nest when you see it? She looked at him, eyes ablaze. What are you talking about, you psychotic fuck? Let me go! A slight smile crept across his face. He reached down and pulled her chin up to meet his gaze. You are the one I've been waiting for. Don't you see? All the others, they were weak. But not you. You are so strong. Mm, I don't like to peacock too much, but uh, I am a professional actor. Uh-huh. Why don't you all just let that sink in for a minute? Done mulling that one over? All right, then. So, acting. Is it hard work? Yeah, sometimes. But those of you out there familiar with HBO's Entourage should know that it's got its perks. Perks like the delicious coffee my assistant brings me. Mmm. Ah! Rebecca! Yes, Mr. Jason? Is that almond milk in my almond milk latte? Ooh, I'm so sorry. The cartons look exactly the same. Yeah, they do look pretty similar. Well, if it's uh, not too much trouble for you, could you maybe bring me another and possibly not fuck it up quite so much this time? Yes, Mr. Jason, right away. Thank you, darling. And, uh... When you get home this evening, maybe think about polishing up the old resume, huh? <sighs> yes, Mr. Jason. Wonderful. Now, uh, you run along, dear. Daddy's working. <laughs> oh, she loves me. But I am getting off topic again. Where was I? Ah, oh, yes. Acting. It's hard work. Especially with regards to the old waistline. Now, many of you have probably heard that the microphone adds 10 pounds. Well, that's ridiculous, of course. It adds 25. And I can't just be stuffing my face with any greasy, processed crap that happens to come my way. No! This is my craft, do you understand? I need food prepared with clean ingredients I can trust. Seasonally sourced for peak freshness, I will suffer no less. But people like me can't just go to the store. I need a USDA certified organic meal kit company. One that sends me pre-measured, perfectly portioned ingredients and mostly already prepped so I can spend less time stressing and more time enjoying delicious home-cooked meals because I'm one of those cool hipster celebrities that always prepares their own food. I don't go to restaurants. Ugh. But that doesn't matter because Green Chef comes right to me. Oh, well, that's right. Green Chef is that USDA certified organic meal kit company I've been searching for. And they have such an amazing selection. I can get a keto meal kit. I can get a vegan meal kit. I can get vegetarian recipes that are high in plant protein and rich in omega-3s, and we know that's good. Example? The delicate and savory pecan crusted trout personal favorite of mine, and uh, if you play your cards right, maybe I'll make it for you one day. And that would definitely be me making it, because, a uh, little secret, my assistant cooks about as well as she makes coffee. <laughs> you know she used to be an executive? It's a, um, that's a, that's a actually a pretty sad story, but, um, j j j just, just put that out of your head. We are focusing on the positive here. And you best listen close, because I am going to tell you what you need to do next. Just go to greenchef.com slash 90CTDN and use promo code 90CTDN to get $90 off, including free shipping. 
And, uh, I know it's sometimes kind of hard to tell when I'm being serious because, uh, actor. <laughs> but seriously, Green Chef is pretty damn awesome. And they also partnered with HelloFresh recently. Sounds like twice as many recipes. Mm-hmm. Yum, yum. But don't forget, before you can strap on the old feed bag, you gotta go to greenchef.com slash 90CTDN and use that promo code 90CTDN to get $90 off, including free shipping. And for the number one meal kit for eating well, that is none too shabby. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. Asab attempted to escape her throat, but she choked it off. He was not going to get the satisfaction of knowing he scared her. He walked over to the table and picked up a metal bowl. He swirled around the contents. She couldn't see it, but she could smell it. She gagged involuntarily. She knew that smell as well as she knew her own name. It was the smell that had plagued her dreams and mornings alike. It smelled like death. He looked at her with a crooked grin. Are you hungry, my love? It's all been working out exactly as planned. I've taken the best parts of them and given them to you to make my perfect mate. She didn't know what to say. She didn't understand what was happening. He sauntered towards her with the bowl in one hand and a large spoon in the other. He snaked the spoon into the bowl and came out with a heap and pile of bloody, rotten meat and what appeared to be teeth. Bile began to rise in her throat. She spat in his face, then screamed, Get away from me, asshole! He shook his head. Honey, please don't do that. It makes me angry and I want this to be very special between us. You've never minded your vitamins before, so be a good girl and take them for daddy. She began to sob. The man backed away from us slowly and placed the bowl back on the table. You know, all the other girls before you prepared me for this moment. The moment when I could make my most perfect girl. Feeding you the best parts of them has made you into my personal science experiment. But it has worked out so nicely. They all screamed and screamed until I had no choice but to shut them up. And that Lucy, well, she was a fighter. Karen gasped as understand and hit her. She had been force-fed her friend. Her stomach heaved in response. She began to cry again. Why? Why are you doing this? He began to walk back to the table and did not attempt to answer her question. She screamed, Answer me, damn it! He looked back at her, shocked, and picked up a large drill with a spade bit on the end and pointed it at her. Enough playing around. We are going to get this done tonight. And then, you will finally be all mine. He headed towards her, squeezing the drill trigger every few seconds for effect. When he reached her, she scrambled as close to the wall as she could get, pulling her chains as hot, fresh tears fell from her eyes. He grabbed the back of her hair and kissed her as she tried to turn away. It's our turn, baby. We're going to be together forever. He said as he placed the drill to the side of her knee. As he pulled the trigger, a fine spray of blood hit his face. She screamed, and all awareness was gone. Regaining consciousness, she was alone again. She looked around apprehensively. She was in excruciating pain. She looked down and saw that in the holes he had drilled, he had placed hinges. She had hinges attached to her knees, hips, and ankles. She screamed as loud as she could and tried moving her legs to no avail. Next, she tried to grab her legs to forcibly move them, but couldn't do that either, 
as there were hinges on her elbows, wrists, and shoulders as well. In shock, she fell over on her right side. She didn't know what to do. She was unable to move her arms or legs on her own accord. She had to think of a way to get out of here, a way to escape. As she was lying there, attempted to think, footsteps echoed into the room. She looked up as he entered. It was so hard to keep track of you. I had to install my surveillance equipment in your apartment, and your car, and your office. It got a bit tiresome. When I decided to start putting sleeping pills in your bottle of Pinot Noir, I could do whatever I wanted with you at night. Oh, what fun times we've had. He held a black box out to her that had several buttons on it. He chuckled. However, it's time that your free will comes to an end, and my absolute control begins. He walked back over to the metal table and picked up the drill. He replaced the drill bit with a different one and picked up a liquid, greenish-blue tube. After I put my new creation into that little brain of yours, you'll have no choice but to do my bidding. Of course, you won't be the same that you were, but you'll still retain some of your... Hmm, best qualities. And I will have the woman I've always wanted. He smiled at her, but she closed her eyes and turned her face away. He walked behind her and lifted her hair. I want to do this in the best place so that your hair will cover the scar. We don't want to mess up this beautiful head of yours. She began to scream and jerk against her chains. She twisted her head back and forth to keep him away. He righted his grip on her hair and wound it round his wrist so that she could not move. Just as she felt the tip of the drill touch her skin, she saw movement from the shadows. Looking up, she saw Miss Wyndham, her landlord, step forward. Oh, thank God, her mind screamed, followed by her pleading voice. Miss Wyndham, help me, please. He's crazy. Call 911. Miss Wyndham didn't say anything, just gave Karen a sad smile. Right before her mind went dark, she heard the basement asshole say, Mother, so glad you could join us. You always get the best girls for me. I hope you enjoyed Body Alterations, as written by Don Shea and voiced by Justine Anastasia and host of the Horror Hill podcast, Jason Hill. As a reminder, you can hear more of Justine Anastasia on our official YouTube channel, where she came in second place in the 2018 Evil Idol voice acting competition, coming just short of becoming our first ever female champion, and where she has been featured in a number of other performances as well, including some of her own stories. If you check her out, be sure to give her performances a thumbs up, leave a kind word, and tell her you heard about her on this show, and that Steve sent you. It would mean a lot to me. You can also hear more of Jason on the Horror Hill podcast, now on its fourth season, with new episodes released weekly. Check it out, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss your regular dose of the dreadful. You won't be sorry that you did. Finally, if you enjoyed Arthur Don Shea, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Shea spelled S-H-E-A, and you'll be redirected to her author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you'll find a one-stop page full of links to her official website, social media, and Amazon page, as well as a means of dropping her a line. I personally recommend you check her out on Amazon.com, where you'll find her publishing company, DT Publishing's many books for print, including her fantastic short story anthology series, The ABCs of Terror. In the ABCs series, you'll discover footsteps on the stairs, cabinets standing open, a drastic drop in temperature, all of them signs that you may be experiencing a visitor from the special plane. 
In the book's 26 stories, you'll get your chance to visit the places where supernatural forces have staked their claim. Places where the dead move freely and stalk the unsuspecting. But before you dive in, remember, keeping the lights on helps most of the time. <laughs> so don't delay. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Shay and click her Amazon link there to pick up your copy of The ABCs of Terror, Volumes 1 or 2 today and let Dawn know that Steve sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of tonight's talented authors and of indie horror. And with that, listeners, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.